Well, it is good to be here with you this morning, and uh, sometimes we as Christians can get a little discouraged as we look at the world around us and changes that are taking place, but I must say that to arrive here at 8.30 in the morning and see all of you uh, come to hear a church historian uh, makes me think there's a chance the postmillennialists are right. Uh, and. Um, uh, it is a delight to be with you. It is a delight to uh, participate uh, with you in this conference. Uh, it is good to be thinking about what is our relationship to the world? Uh, in what ways do we stand with the world? In what ways do we stand in the world? And in uh, this session, to think a little bit about the ways from time to time we must stand against the world. And uh, to think through some aspects of that question, we want to look this morning at uh, one of the most important figures in church history, although I suspect a figure not very well known to many uh, Protestants, um, St. Athanasius. Now, you all came here to hear about St. Athanasius, right? Uh, <laughs> In the, in the curious providence of God, as I was leaving here last night, I bumped into a Greek couple, and we got to talking about Greek orthodoxy. Uh, and uh, they were very pleased that I was talking about an orthodox uh, Christian. It's about time we had some orthodoxy around here. And uh, um, uh, it is uh, a delight to be able to go back and talk about this man, Athanasius. You know, even with seminary students, I always had trouble with them and Athanasius. I always asked them on tests to identify Athanasius, and I warned them before the test, you better spell his name right. <laughs> Anybody as important as Athanasius deserves to have his name spelled right. There are no E's in Athanasius. There's only A's. He was a triple A guy. And uh, so, Athanasius was once so famous that his name became proverbial. I don't know whether that's a compliment or not, but it's certainly remarkable for someone to become so famous that your name becomes part of a proverb spoken over and over for centuries. And the proverb was, as you may know, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. Where did that proverb come from? How did it arise? What did it mean to say Athanasius against the world? Well, that's part of what we want to look at this morning. Um, because he illustrates for us, because he encourages us to think about what it means to take a heroic stand for Christ, even when it appears that everyone stands against you. Now, we don't need to do that all the time. That's not called being heroic, that's called being obnoxious. <laughs> and uh, we have to work at making that distinction between being heroic and being obnoxious. Uh, Athanasius was a hero, and his story should inspire us, should encourage us. And um, the place to start, I think, perhaps is reading from John's Gospel. I think Athanasius must often, often, often have read from the first chapter of John's gospel. He had an advantage over us. He read it naturally in Greek. And uh, we'll just read it in English, most of us, this morning. I want to read the first five verses and then verses 9 through 13. This is God's own Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God, 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And Athanasius was one of the great champions of these verses, one of the ones who said, we have to understand these verses faithfully, carefully, and profoundly if we are under, to understand Jesus Christ, who He is, and what He's done for us. And he became a champion, particularly, of the eternal divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He became a champion of that little phrase, the Word was God. And in defense of that, he gave his life. And so we want to talk to him about him. He was a Greek speaker, but he was an Egyptian. And uh, very possibly, the blood of ancient Egyptians flowed in his veins. He was um, a resident most of his life of Alexandria. In his day, he was born about 300. Alexandria was perhaps the most important city on the Mediterranean, a vast city of, of commerce and learning and religion. And Athanasius, because of his remarkable talent, emerged as a very young man to a leading role in that church and in that city and in the life of the church of his day. He was a great defender of orthodoxy, and he was short. <laughs> his enemies called him a dwarf, and he would come to oppose in his day a preacher in um, Alexandria who came to oppose the eternal divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, a, a preacher by the name of Arius. Now, you should stamp your feet when you hear his name, you know, like the, the Jews do on Purim when they hear of Haman. Um, Arius had huge advantages over Athanasius. Arius was tall and uh, extremely handsome uh, by the standards of the day in the church, which is to say he was extremely skinny, showing that he had fasted greatly and at long length. So he was tall and ascetic, and he was a powerful preacher and speaker. He attracted a large following. And so this becomes, you know, one of the useful lessons you can take away. It is more likely to trust short people than tall people. <laughs> Not necessarily, but in this particular case. Uh, as a, a young man, probably only about 25 years of age, he was invited by the bishop of Alexandria, whose name was Alexander. I always tell seminary students, wasn't that considerate of the Alexandrians to elect a bishop named Alexander so it would be much easier for students to remember his name? And uh, Bishop Alexander, seeing the talent of this young uh, Athanasius, when Athanasius was probably only in his mid-twenties, invited him to become a key advisor to Alexander as Alexander faced this issue in the church of confronting a rising power in a preacher who was preaching against the truth as the church understood it. And in his youth then already, Athanasius was emerging as a voice, as a leader, as a thinker to help the church preserve its commitment to Jesus Christ and the truth as it is in Him. And that would be a journey that he began that would be a journey at times of great success, but at other times of great loneliness, great suffering, great deprivation. And in it all, the days of success and the days of suffering, Athanasius stood unflinching, unmoved. When he died, uh, St. Basil of Caesarea pronounced an epitaph on Athanasius and said he was a lighthouse. 
seeing with his ubiquitous eye all that was passing in the temp tempestuous sea below, treachery, stupidity, shipwreck, and like a lighthouse, he showed the promised land. Now there's an epitaph worth having. He was a lighthouse. He revealed the error, and he showed the truth. And that's what it meant for Athanasius, when necessary, to stand against the world. The first thing that he did in standing against the world was to stand for the truth. Augustine once said, speaking about martyrdom, he said, causa non poina facet martyrum. It's the cause, not the punishment, that makes the martyr. You're not a martyr just by dying. You're a martyr by standing for the truth. And that's what Athanasius did. He stood for the truth even when he had to stand against the world. He was a hero because he testified that the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ is what is crucial, what is worth living for, what is worth dying for, what is worth suffering for. And so Athanasius became a champion of that truth, first in the city of Alexandria as Arius began to become more and more popular. Alexandrians were famous for being a somewhat riotous city. Um, they would often gather and demonstrate in crowds and in mobs in the streets. And Arius began to attract a party that would follow him. And when his crowds were in the street, they had a song that they sang. Have you ever noticed how frequently bad causes have really attractive music? Now that's a theme we don't have time to go into at any length uh, uh, today. Um, that would be a good course in a D-min program. Uh, the dangers of good music to promoting bad causes. I'll, I'll come and teach it, yeah, because I'm so musical. Um, <laughs> my sons, who are fairly musical, used to stand next to me in church and occasionally start laughing uncontrollably, and I would say, why are you laughing? And they would say, Dad, do you actually think you're singing the tune they're playing? Uh, <laughs> Well, Arius had a jingle for his followers to sing in the streets, and the jingle was a simple one. It went this way, there was when he was not. There was when he was not. I don't know if any of you mus musicians are beginning to get a tune in mind, forget it. Um, there was when he was not. What did that mean? There was, God was, the Father was when the sun was not. It's a song that declares that Christ is not eternal. He is not everlasting. He has not always but been. He is a creation in a profound sense of the Father. There was, the Father was, when He, the Son, was not. Well, Athanasius and the Orthodox were having none of this, and so they, they wrote their own song. You ready? There was not when he was not. I mean, come on. It, it, it doesn't work anywhere near as well, does it? There was not when he was not. And, and what it means to say is, if you could actually posit a situation in which the sun was not, then there was nothing. I told you it wasn't very good. Um, it was slightly catchy, um, but it was a great testimony that the Son was eternal. And whatever can be said of the Father must also be said of the Son in terms of His divinity, His eternality. There was not when He was not. The Father and the Son are equally God. They are one God. They are distinct persons but they are equally God. And this is crucial 
Athanasius and Bishop Alexander and many in the church of his day declared it's crucial not just as an esoteric theological question. Now, I have to be very careful here because Dr. Sproul will very quickly say there are no esoteric theological questions. They are all important, and there's a profound truth to that. But Arius and some of his defenders said, you know, let's not get caught up in too much technical discussion. Let's not fight about these things. Let's all just agree to be biblical and use biblical language. And um, don't rock the boat. Don't, don't trouble the church. What does it really matter? And Athanasius and those who stood with him said, it matters profoundly. It matters absolutely. It matters and we cannot let people take refuge in ambiguous language and in the abuse of the Bible and pretend to believe the Bible when they really don't. And sometimes to accomplish that purpose, to flush out the heretic, you have to come up with a technical language that is sufficiently precise and careful and exact that it can filter out heresy, that the heretics can't abuse it, that the heretics can't misuse it. Now, that's not an easy task because heretics are very creative. The Westminster Assembly thought they had said about as clearly and carefully that the Bible was absolutely true as any document could when they said, the Word of God is infallible. But then we had later clever heretics who came along and said, oh, I believe the Word is infallible. I just don't believe it's inerrant. <laughs> if anything, taken in its true sense and in and of itself, the word infallible is stronger than the word inerrant. But when heretics come along and take words and abuse words and misuse words and change words, then occasionally you have to come up with a new word to catch them. And that's what happened in Athanasius' day. Can we find a word? Can we find a word that the heretics can't tolerate that will make clear the problem with them? There was so much trouble in Alexandria in the streets that it came to the attention of Constantine. Constantine had not been emperor very long. Uh, Constantine had uh, won a great victory at the Milvian Bridge in 312, conquered Rome, began to march east, asserting himself ever more broadly, uh, encouraging the church. And Constantine had become clear in his own mind, we're not sure how clear he was about religion generally, but clear in his own mind that there was something special about the Christian church, something special about the Christian message, something true about the Christian God, and Constantine said, I want peace in the Christian church. And if there's all this trouble in Alexandria, we'd better get leaders of the church together to figure out how to bring peace, because I'm sure of this, God wants His church unified in truth and in peace. And so he called a great council to meet in the city of Nicaea. The city of Nicaea is in modern Turkey, not too far outside of what was then the growing city of Constantinople, today the great city of Istanbul. And there, the emperor had a palace, and he invited bishops, about 300 bishops showed up to his imperial palace to hold the first ecumenical universal council of the church to discuss this issue that had troubled Christians in Alexandria. And it must have been a most remarkable gathering because some of the bishops came into the imperial palace with the wounds and the scars on their bodies of imperial persecution 
only 15 years earlier. And how suddenly their world had been turned upside down. One bishop who had had one of his eyes dug out, others who had had a hand burned, standing for Christ, suffering imperial wrath, gladly bearing the shame and the persecution, and now suddenly finding themselves invited to the imperial palace itself and having the emperor himself enter clothed in purple and in gold, Constantine could put on a good show. And he mounted his imperial throne, and before these gathered bishops began the meeting by saying, my most dear brothers. They were shocked. They all became post-millennialists in a moment. Constantine said, we have to settle this issue. We have to come to the truth. And they debated, and they debated, and they asked, what, what, are, the, what are the words that will make this clear? What, what is the word that can unify us in the truth? And someone came up with the word homoousios, a Greek word meaning the same substance, the same substance. And some of Arius' defenders got very nervous, and they said, that's not a biblical word. You can't make people believe that. And the response was, it expresses clearly and inescapably the biblical truth. The Son is of the same divine substance as the Father. And that came to be agreed upon and came to be incorporated then in the great Nicene Creed. The great creed that was produced by this council in 325 with the young Athanasius there cheering them on, encouraging them. The creed that has in some ways been the most widely used and popular creed in the history of the church. Initially much more widely used than the Apostles' Creed. A very important creed. We believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. That covers everything, doesn't it? All things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, a very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance, being of the same substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and suffered, was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried according to the Scriptures. And on the third day He rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and He shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end." There's a, there's a confession to be going on with, isn't it? Now, this is an interesting church historical question. Has Athanasius ever gotten a hand before? Uh, I, I don't know the answer. Actually, you know, in the ancient church, um, in the ancient church, they were famous for preachers. And um, two centuries after, not quite two centuries after Athanasius, uh, the church produced what might have been in the East the greatest preacher in the whole history of the church, John Chrysostom. John the Golden-mouthed. And John Chrysostom was such a powerful preacher that he was constantly being interrupted by applause. That was a practice in the Eastern Church. And it drove Chrysostom crazy. And he finally preached one of his most eloquent sermons against applauding preachers.
Dr. Sproul was there, and um, <laughs> we don't have a tape of that sermon. But we do have a transcript of it, and what is, uh, what is charming is he's, he's preaching with all his very remarkable powers. Uh, at one point he says, now, when you go into the studio of a great painter, a- and you see him with all of his concentration and, and, and the glorious work that he is, is displaying as he's painting, is it, isn't there a a hush that falls over the studio as you're moved by the glory of the painter. And, and shouldn't that be this, the same in church, that there should be a hush of awe? And then the transcript says, Chrysostom next said, there you go again, applauding. Stop that. <laughs> uh, the sermon against applause was constantly interrupted by applause. Well, that's completely unrelated to what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> I think I'm just going to give up. Um, <laughs> so, we're at the Council of Nicaea. A great creed has been uh, um, written. Uh, a, a great confession has been made. The Son is of the same substance with the Father. And, and we really need to pause here as we think of Athanasius standing for the truth. Because this isn't just an incidental victory. This isn't just an unimportant council. What is at stake when we say that Jesus is of the same substance, the Son is of the same substance with the Father? What's at stake in that? Well, what's at stake is the truth about Jesus and who He is. He is the Word made flesh. He is God made flesh. And and if He is God, then it is right that we should worship Him. One of the reasons that the truth succeeded is people in the pews said, you know, we've been praying to Jesus for a long time. If He's not divine, we shouldn't be praying to Him. But if He is divine, if He is the eternal second person of the Trinity, then it is right that we should worship Him, that we should pray to Him, that we should have confidence that He can hear us, that we can have confidence that He will help us. And what we begin to see is that the issue of who Jesus is is inextricably bound with the question of what does Jesus do? What has Jesus done for us? Arius said, Jesus has taught us about the Father as God. Well, that was true as far as it went. Jesus has shown us as a great example how a human being should live. Well, that's true as far as it goes. And what Jesus did as Savior was to cheer you on to work hard. That is not true even as far as it goes. But you see what happens. If Jesus is not divine, then what kind of a Savior can He be? And Athanasius understood that profoundly. He saw that issue. If Jesus is not divine, He cannot have offered a sacrifice of infinite value for His people on the cross. He cannot be a Savior to save us to the uttermost. He cannot be a Savior to fully satisfy the wrath of God. He cannot be a Savior who can hear the cries of His people and come to help us and come to forgive us. These are not esoteric theological issues. These are not little mean-spirited church fights. This is a fight for truth at its most basic level. One of the great issues here 
is does Jesus bring the final Word of God? Those of you who may have studied Islam will know this is an absolutely crucial question in the confrontation between Christianity and Islam. Islam is willing to say that Jesus was a prophet, a great prophet, a truth-telling prophet. But like all the prophets, it is possible for a later prophet to come with yet more truth, which is what Muhammad claimed for himself, that he brought more truth than Jesus had brought. But the New Testament says Jesus was a prophet, but much more than the prophet. In the old days, God spoke through the prophets, we read in Hebrews, but in our day, He has spoken through His Son, the eternal Son, who brings, therefore, the final word, the full revelation, the complete declaration of the redemptive work of God. No prophet can come after Jesus and tell us more truth than Jesus told us. And so again, we see how everything related to Jesus, His being prophet, priest, and king, are tied up with who He is, that He is divine, that He is the proper object of our worship, that He is the Word become flesh, God coming to be one with us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves so that He might take us back reconciled to the Father. That's what Athanasius was standing for when he stood for the truth. And that's why this episode in church history is so crucial, why Athanasius rightly became proverbial for standing for the truth, and secondly, standing against the lie. In the end of the day, you cannot stand for the truth without standing against the lie. There are some people who want to be positive all the time, and I like those people. They're they're nicer than the people I hang around with. (laughs) But the truth is, to really make the truth known, to really defend the truth, to really grasp the truth, We have to be willing also to stand against the lie and to say, not only is this right, but this is wrong. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. It's a hard thing to do in a loving way, in an appropriate way. But it's absolutely necessary, and that's what Athanasius learned in his life. He had to be willing to stand against the lie. That, of course, first came to him in the, in the great struggle against Arius in the city of Alexandria. But, you know, after the great victory at Nicaea in 325, there were probably some riding home from the council thought, that one's taken care of, all settled. There'll never be another Arian that we'll have to face. Do you know that you've faced Arians? Every time a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, you're facing an Arian. Same teaching. That's what Athanasius soon found. The battle for truth never is over until Jesus comes again with glory. And if you want to be a soldier of Christ, if you want to be a champion of the truth, you have to face it that the battle is never over. I remember working as a very much younger man with R.C. Sproul in the 1970s in the Council for Biblical Inerrancy. R.C. provided such great leadership uh, for that great movement in the 1970s. And there was great fruit to that work and to that movement. And, and evangelicals far and wide were reinvigorated in their commitment to the inerrancy of God's Word. And then that battle was over, and we'll never have to face that struggle again. Well, no, every generation has to take up 
the battle for truth. It's never settled. It's never over. Um, John, who wrote that the Word became flesh, who wrote that the Word was God, also wrote in the Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The war of the dragon on the church is not a future prophesied event. It's the daily experience of the church through her whole history. The dragon is furious at you and is making war and we have to be prepared for the battle. We have to be prepared to stand up for the truth. Three years after the Council of Nicaea, Athanasius was elected at just about the age of 30 to be Bishop of Alexandria after the death of Bishop Alexander. And almost immediately he began to face trouble. Almost immediately he began to realize there were voices around the emperor who were saying, you know, that Arius is such a nice guy. He got a raw deal at Nicaea. They didn't really understand him. They were sort of carried away. They were too strict. Arius has learned a lot. You know, we really need to make peace with him. We really need to restore him to the church. Arius had not only been deposed from his office, he'd been excommunicated. And finally, Constantine is convinced by those around him that Arius should be restored. Now, there was a little problem. The Council of Nicaea had also adopted some regulations of church order for the life of the church. And one of the regulations was that a person excommunicated could be restored to the church only by the bishop of the church where he'd been excommunicated, which means the only person who had the right to lift the excommunication against Arius was Athanasius. And this really, in a sense, becomes one of the first moments where Athanasius is standing against the world. And the tragedy is, as is so often the truth in church history, standing against the world as a Christian often means standing against an awful lot of the church. We're never surprised when the world acts like the world. The tragedy is when the church acts like the world. And suddenly, Athanasius receives an imperial recommendation. Uh, Imperial recommendations were never recommendations. They were never matters for discussion. Athanasius receives an imperial command to lift the decree of excommunication against Arius. And Athanasius stood against the world and stood against the emperor and said, no. He's a heretic. He is condemned by the church. He is not repentant. I will not lift the bowl of excommunication. And so what did Constantine do? He deposed Athanasius. If the bishop won't do what I tell him to do, I'll have my bishop who will. And Athanasius began the first of five exiles that would take place during the 45 years he served as bishop. He was exiled a total of about 17 years out of the 45 he was bishop. Five times exiled by emperors from his see. Athanasius against the world. This is a remarkably dramatic moment for him. He's exiled, he's in many ways abandoned, and Arius is triumphant. Arius travels to Constantinople so that he can be officially received back into the church in the very presence of the imperial grandeur 
and dignity in the imperial capital. All the plans are made. It's like getting ready for a national conference, months of work. It's going to be a grand spectacle. And the night before the excommunication was to be lifted, Arius died. There were competing theories of providence at that moment. <laughs> we know that Athanasius said, struck down by God, who bore testimony that he was a heretic and rightly excommunicated. Others said, poisoned by Athanasius and his crowd. We don't know for sure what happened. Athanasius wasn't anywhere around to be poisoning. But here Athanasius stood for the truth and against the lie and willing to give up everything. Think of all the voices that came to Athanasius and said, well, you know, it, you can't succeed in opposing the emperor. And if you just make this one little concession, Think how influential you'll be. You can keep your post. You can do so much good. You can carry on. You can preach about everything. Don't fight the emperor. And we little Athanasius said, I'll stand against the world if I'm standing for Christ and standing for the truth and standing for the gospel. On another occasion, he was leading a worship service in his cathedral church in Alexandria. And the imperial troops, this was about 20 years later, the imperial troops surrounded the church and they entered the building and they were clearly on their way to arrest Athanasius and carry him off to what would be his third exile. And Athanasius turned to the congregation and said, sing, sing. Sing Psalm 137 about the captivity of Israel. How shall we sing the songs of Zion in a far land? But God will return, and God will vindicate. And so as the sounds of this mournful psalm rose in the church, Athanasius was carried out to yet another exile. But God stayed with him. God prospered him. God made him a hero. God made him a proverb. God made him an amazing blessing to the church because when necessary, Athanasius stood against the world for the truth, against the lie, confident because he stood on the Word. The Word was God, Athanasius read in John chapter 1. And he said what that means is the Son is of the same substance with the Father. And this is a truth that we must live for. This is a truth that we must die for because everything about the person and work of Christ rests on this truth. And it's the truth of the Word. It's not a truth that Athanasius made up. It's not a, a truth that the church made up. It's the truth revealed over and over again in so many different ways, in so many different places in the Scripture. Jesus is God come in the flesh. I don't know this for a fact, but I think there's another part of the word that Athanasius stood on. You know, I think most of us as students of the Bible, when we, when we hear about Egypt, we think about Pharaoh, we think about opposition to God and to His people in the Old Testament. And of course, that is the dominant picture of Egypt in the Old Testament. But do you remember there's a prophecy in the Old Testament of better days coming for Egypt? In Isaiah, the 19th chapter, at verse 19, we read, 
In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, He will send them a Savior and Defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make Himself known to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and offering, and they will make vows to the Lord and perform them, and the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord, and He will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people." What a prophecy. What an amazing promise. I think Athanasius knew that promise, that prophecy. And I think Athanasius, in the midst of all of his struggles against the world, time and time, cried out to the Lord and then rested in the promise, the Lord will send them a Savior, a Defender, and a Deliverer. And Athanasius thought, the Lord has done that. That's not a prophecy yet to be fulfilled in Athanasius' day. That's a prophecy that had been fulfilled in Athanasius' day. Historians tell us that by about the year 300, a majority of the population of Egypt had become professing Christians. And in that day, Egypt had a population of between seven and eight million people. And Egypt then, from about 300 to about 645, when the forces of Islam conquered Egypt, Egypt was a Christian country. So the forces of Islam have ruled Egypt for about 1,500 years. But you know the part of the story that usually doesn't get told? The majority of Egyptians remained Christian down to about the year 1,000. So for 350 years of Islamic rule, the majority of Christians, the majority of Egyptians remained Christian. And then gradually, under the harassment of the Islamic rule, more and more people became Muslims in Egypt. And today, 90% of Egypt is Muslim, but 10% of Egypt is still professing Christians. And do you know what that 10% of professing Christians amounts to today? About 8 million people. Now, I don't know the hearts of those 8 million people. I don't know how purely they understand the gospel. I don't know whether their hearts rest truly by faith in Christ and in His saving work. But I do know this. For 1,500 years, those people have stood against the pressure of Islam and have said, we believe in Jesus Christ. And today, Jesus has just as many people professing His name in Egypt, indeed more probably, than He did in the day of Athanasius. The Lord had promised to, to, that to those in Egypt who called out to Him, He would be a defender and a deliverer and a redeemer. And the glorious truth for us out of the life of Athanasius is that the Word of God is always true. 
that the Word of God is always fulfilled, that we can have absolute confidence in the Word of God and what it says about the person of Christ, about the work of Christ, about the future of Christ's church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Christ will build His church in every generation, not perhaps with the success that the world will count success, but through courageous Christians who will stand contra mundum for the truth, against the lie, and on the Word. And I think the reason you're at this conference is you want to be built up in that kind of faith, in that kind of commitment to show that kind of courage so that whether we live in days of suffering and exile or of success and establishment, we stand for Christ and for Christ alone. May God, by His Holy Spirit, grant you that kind of courage and faith. Contra mundum. Thank you.